everybody. Welcome back to the PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast. I'm Jess Navarez here with Dalton Miller. I wish we were talking on a victory. Let's see. What is it? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Whenever you're listening to this podcast, not the case. Dallas Cowboys fall short to the Philadelphia Eagles. 23-28 in a game of inches. Dalton, how many times are you going to say that phrase this week? Because really, that's what it came down to. I'm not. I'm not going to say it. Um... The, the game of inches thing for me is a bit like the, um, oh, what is it called game for you that you hate the, um, ew, don't do it. You know what the I'm saying? Trap game? Trap yes, game? the trap game. I so hate that. Game of inches for me is like the cliche that is the trap game for you. It's just, I, oh, I yeah. don't like it. Obviously it's a game of inches. It's one of the most precise things. Like, I mean, obviously, like baseball, you have a strike zone and stuff like that, but like passes have to be pinpoint. And, you know, shout out to Jalen Hurts. I thought Jalen was unbelievable yesterday as a passer. Um, But I think when you look at this game overall, and I say this as somebody whose fandom for the Dallas Cowboys has pretty much become non existent, like the, the loss to the Eagles, for me, it didn't even hurt. And that's that's tough for me growing up as a fan of this football team to feel like that. But doing this job this long, your fandom just kind of goes away at the end of the day. I say that to say this. The refereeing in this game, and I know that the penalties ended up being 10 to 10, and I know that the Eagles had more penalty yards. 50 of them came on one play. The refs were horrendous. In this game and the Dallas Cowboys for all intents and purposes outplayed the Philadelphia Eagles. Now I think that this is two of the top five best teams in the NFL. I really do. And the, the Cowboys dropped in the power rankings, but they have three losses now. And there's a couple good teams in this league, but I really do truly believe that the Cowboys outplayed Philadelphia and it didn't matter at the end of the day because you can't beat a very good football team and the self-inflicted wounds that they had and the wounds from key penalties in crucial spots. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's frustrating because the topic of conversation seems to come up anytime that they lose and you, you look at the penalty count when they lose and it's a highly penalized game. And you know, the thing is we go back to talking about, Hey, when you know, they're calling that kind of game, you just have to play smarter. But Overall, I mean, it was on both sides of the ball. It wasn't just the Cowboys, the Eagles as well. They were getting some pretty crazy penalties. There was a lot of missed opportunities um, within this game for penalties, I think, on both sides of the ball here. So um, overall, I, I just I don't like when the officiating feels like it's dictating kind of how the game is going because the momentum shifts were just yeah. crucial and they were so killer. Oh, my goodness. They came at the worst possible time for both sides of the ball. I, I mean, really, but it, it went both ways in this game. So it is frustrating because it does feel like the self-inflicted wounds, like you said, just continue to determine these losses for them. And and so I, I, I do think the Cowboys played a better game overall. I think this should be a good game for them to reflect back on what really needs work. But there's also some aspects of their game that I think they can take out of it and keep growing, right? And I don't think you saw any kind of real setback for the good things that they've been working on, especially the last three weeks, you know, and before the buy and after. So I don't think it was as horrible of a loss. I think the final 30 seconds is going to make it feel worse than what it actually was um, because they were in that game. They were still in that game up until the last five seconds of it. And so, uh, man, that's, that's a, That's a fun game to watch, though. That's a great football game through and through. It was fun all four quarters. And it's really hard to watch a football game that intensely, I think, right now in terms of what you see across the NFL. Yeah, I I tweeted it out last night right after it happened. I said that was a an incredibly played football game. I mean, when you look at it there, I don't think there were any turnovers in this game. There weren't any interceptions. There were a couple of fumbles that the Eagles had that they were able to jump back on. Um, but it was a, a cleanly played for, for all for for the most part. It was a cleanly played game between two really good football teams. I loved that the Cowboys matched the aggressiveness of the Philadelphia Eagles going forward on fourth down and, and, and things of that nature. 
I thought that Dak and Jalen both played out of their minds well passing the football. I, I thought that that was some of the sharpest ball placement I've seen from Jalen Hurts. And to do that against the Cowboys, it was really fun to watch those two guys playing well against each other because we haven't had the opportunity to really see both of them healthy in a game like this. So, yes, it it stinks that the Cowboys lost. It stinks that they're now two and a half games back from the Philadelphia Eagles. Eagles have a very difficult schedule in the back half of the season. So we'll see what happens with that. And the Cowboys will still have another opportunity to to beat them this year in the regular season and, and kind of, you know, bridge that gap. But I do think that this is a game they really, really wanted. I think it's a game that they outplayed Philadelphia in. And it just comes down to the little things. It's always just the little things with this team. Yeah, and and the thing about this loss is that it stings now, and then they're going to turn the page and start focusing Mm -hmm. on the Giants, but it's going to sting later, too, when you're talking playoff seeding and everything that could have been, right? You're talking the difference between home field advantage and not having that, or you're talking about, you know, having first round by. I mean, it just depends on where things lay on later down in, in the season with everybody. But for the most part, what's going to be interesting to see about this Philadelphia team is a few things going on here. Yes, they played phenomenal. Jalen Hurts, I don't know how he was able to get back up from being popped in the knee uh, by Demarcus Lawrence. That was I was terrified for him and yeah. I was already scared for him going into this game because he is, he is struggling on that knee. He, you can see it. You can tell he's just not the full top notch Jalen hurts, but even it's, this watered down version that he's able to create plays with, he's still running on that knee. And I don't know was, how yeah, he, was the, he was the NFL offensive player of the week last week with the, with the bum ankle and knee. And now he's got an even it's, bummer knee. Like it's that insane. Hit, that hit when I saw Lawrence hit him, I was like, "Oh, like that's that's one of those like Nick Chubb, like oh his leg might snap, type of of hits." And to see him get back right back into the game, that dude is tough as nails. And, and yeah. I think the Cowboys yeah. fans, even though he plays for the rival, and it's really really easy to hate the Philadelphia Eagles, it's really easy to hate Nick Sirianni and that organization. But I think that Jalen Hurts is about as likable a guy that there is in the NFL and to me right up there with Dak Prescott and which is probably why he got so many Dak Prescott comps coming out of college. Oh yeah. He's, he is what you want out of a quarterback. He's a leader through and through. He's very even keeled. Even his post game interview. I was really impressed with him in that uh, aspect. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunate he plays for the Eagles, right? Because uh, if Jalen Hurts played anywhere else, we'd be all about it but uh i do hope for the best in terms of his health with that knee because you're officially halfway through the season going into this next week and you have a lot more football to play you need a healthy jalen hurts especially when you're talking the uh chunk of their schedule that they have coming up he needs to be healthy um and and i really hope that they're smart with him in terms of what they're allowing him to do because you cannot afford for another hit like that to happen. You cannot afford for Jalen Hurts to go down. I mean, it's it's scary. When you're talking about the health of any player at any point who's playing through injury, it's scary and you're in that point of the season where everyone's kind of dinged up, but that's a knee. That is a knee that's uh, he's clearly already trying to work through, and I thought it was so interesting that Aaron Andrews during her halftime report uh, said that she talked to, I believe it was Sirianni, and he said, yeah, no, Jalen didn't get anything done. He just went back in for an IV and then he came back out. It's like, oh my goodness, this this guy's unreal. So Jalen Hurts gets his flowers no matter mm-hmm. what because he absolutely played incredible. But Dalton, do you have a hot or not take of the week or are, are we just kind of like venting today? Because either one's fine, but I just want to make sure we have a safe space to vent if needed. No, I'm going to save my hot or not for the okay. end of the, the program uh, when oh. we get to talking about the New York football Giants and the Dallas Cowboys game that is upcoming. 
uh, because it's it, guys, it's it's gonna be ugly. But anyways, let's uh, let's get back on uh, let's get back on. Oh, okay, all right. While we're on the topic of injuries, let's just go over kind of what we saw uh, in terms of Cowboys injuries. I think the most notable one was Cavante Turpin, and it was a rib injury that he was out of the game with for about seven minutes. He was getting checked in the blue medical tent uh, by Brett Brown and his staff there, and then comes back in. First play that he comes back in from this questionable return from a rib injury, gets a touchdown, and uh, absolutely just, he fought hard. He played a well-fought game. Cavante Turpin just continues to impress me um, and get better and better. He's somebody that last season I talked to a lot because, um, y- you know, when it's your first season kind of going through and covering an NFL team, you kind of connect with those rookies a little bit more because you're all going through it together and you talk to them a little bit more and you're, t- you're kind of relating to them in sense of nerves and having to grow in this space. And, and it's now or never, right? You're, you're in the big leagues. And so, uh, Terp was one of the guys that I talked to a lot last season because I just thought his story was so intriguing and his skill set was so interesting. And then I found, I found out he had a background in gymnastics and I was like, that makes so much sense. I watch you run and it just, it looked familiar growing up doing gymnastics. It, it just, we had a little bond there um, with that. And so looking back to where Terp was a year ago, I just talked to him about this the other day because I wanted to talk about him on the podcast. And I asked him compared to this time last year, what's the biggest differences for you? How are you feeling better? And not only did he have rest, you're seeing a well-rested Cavante Turpin now because this time last year, that was non-existent for him. He was going football season to football season to football season. So obviously his body was tired by the time this point came last season. But now you're seeing a well-rested Cavante Turpin and you're seeing a more locked in version of him because being just a special teams guy last year, he didn't have the same kind of locked in vision, if you will, as he does now being in terms of being a bigger part of the offense. And so I think, again, you're starting to see McCarthy open his playbook up a little bit more, which is why you're seeing a little bit more Cavante involvement. But man, his involvement in the offense has helped him and his downfield vision in special teams through and through. Like, if you're a punter and you're kicking the ball to Turp, why? I mean, really, why? You you just know what's going to happen if you if you do. So I'm really excited for him. I hope he's good with the rib. We'll hear from the coordinators and Mike McCarthy a little bit later today. We're recording this on Monday. So hopefully we'll get a little more clarity with uh, how he's feeling today, how things are going. But I really hope the best for Turp because he has worked his butt off to be where he is right now in this league. So... Um, that's my little Cavante Turpin spiel for the day, everybody. Uh, it's Turpin time all the time and I'm really excited about that. All right, Dalton, let's get into it. Let's stick on the terms of offense. What did you see from the Cowboys offense in this showdown, this NFC East rivalry showdown? What did you see? What did you like? The good, the bad, the ugly lay it on us. Uh, I, I'm really liking the way that this offense is looking structurally now. Uh, there's so much more motion motion at the snap. They're using the fast motion. And I think that they could kind of maximize the way that they use that that fast, cheap motion that, that Miami kind of made famous. But I, I think that they're using Brandon Cooks in that motion quite a bit. And I think that that's good. Try to get him downfield on a free release. They've also used it a little bit in the run game as well. And I think that that's a really good call from them because they need to figure something out in the run game to open up some holes because what they're doing right now isn't working. I think that there's a time where the Dallas Cowboys offense kind of devolves back into what they feel is comfortable. And they do this a lot on on third and fourth and shorts where they'll try to roll out Dak Prescott off of play action and it'll be a naked boot it'll be with an unblocked edge defender and those edge defenders because the run game isn't working very well right now they are not crashing down and trying to make plays backside they are going and sticking with Dak Prescott on that rollout it's not working anymore so I think that we need to figure out some of the short yardage situation stuff but overall the offense looks fantastic Dak Prescott is playing some of the best football I've seen him play in his career and really looking more towards that, you know, 2018, 2019 Dak Prescott. But this is the most we've seen him use his legs in a long time. And I think Mina Kimes tweeted it out yesterday that nobody has a higher completion percentage when throwing on the run than Dak Prescott does this year. 
And Dak has looked fantastic using his legs to create. And he's going to have to continue to do that because his right tackle at the moment in pass protection is a complete liability. I love Terrence Steele. I've been a big fan of his since maybe not that first year because he was still an undrafted rookie and he was not very good. But we've seen him take huge strides in the past couple of seasons and he is just not very good right now. And I think that that's okay to say. When it comes down to it, Dak Prescott is good enough to where he can kind of handle one guy for the most part. Usually the problem arises when there are other offensive line breakdowns and he's trying to create a little bit and he's unable to do so because there are multiple avenues of approach to get in. And I think when you have a a right tackle who is getting beat literally almost double digit times a game. You need to have an answer for that, whether it's Rico Dowdle and Tony Pollard staying in the block, whether it's going with a little bit more 21 personnel and using Hunter a little bit more. Do something to help out your struggling right tackle, just like you're trying to do things to help out your struggling wide receiver in Michael Gallup. And listen, Jalen Tolbert, shout out to him. Touchdown last night. First NFL touchdown. First NFL touchdown. He He's starting to kind of cut into some of those snaps for Michael Gallup. And that's unfortunate for Gallup, but you got to make plays. And and it it comes down to Michael has continued to make big plays when he needs to. The problem is right before half that third down, you have to catch that football. There's, there's no excuse for that drop. And so you need him to just get his head right. And I don't know if having Tolbert come in and kind of cut into those snaps is going to do that for Gallup. But I think that him coming in and cutting those snaps and playing well when he does come in is a good thing for the Dallas Cowboys. And sometimes even when the money is with one person or one player, you have to do what's best for your football team. And I think a a split of the offensive snaps is what is best for this football team right now. I I'm so torn about this because what I obviously Michael Gallup has not been Michael Gallup and the MG that you you know and um that you know he can be. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, I have a frog in my throat. Uh, allergy season all the time over here in Texas. Um, but what I wonder is if what you're seeing out of Jalen Tolber is kind of Mike McCarthy, uh, seeing more of him, that is, if it's a product of Mike McCarthy opening up his playbook a little bit more and showing a little bit more of those unscouted looks, because I still don't think you've seen a full force offense at this point. I still think there's so many different things that they have just kind of held close to their chest in not showing their hands. So yeah, although I do think Jalen Tolbert obviously is cutting into some of those reps and snaps for MG. I also think a lot of it is you're kind of saving Jalen Tolbert in a way. So that way you have him healthy by the end of the season and he's starting to get his feet kind of under him at this point. It's not necessarily, Oh, MG. No, no, you're, you're not going to be part of this offense because the guys don't feel like that. I can tell you right now, Dak Prescott doesn't feel like that. CeeDee Lamb doesn't feel like that. I mean, it's not a product of what I'm hearing inside of the locker room. Is It really does seem like when you're seeing a little bit more Jalen Tolbert involvement, that's what you should have been seeing this whole time too. It shouldn't have ever been anything that is, un I don't know, unordinary or out of the ordinary, I should say, because – you should you should utilize him. He has worked his butt off to be here. Jalen Tolbert a year ago didn't know what was going on. He was still building confidence. He was still learning the playbook. He was learning how to be an NFL player. And so now what you're seeing is a product of all of that hard work that he's put in for the last year. He is a phenomenal note taker. His notebook is absolutely insane, uh, according to Schottenheimer, who, who pointed that out at training camp. But I don't necessarily think Tolbert's involvement has anything to do with Michael Gallup. I think it has everything to do with Jalen Tolbert deserving a spot and everything that he's done in the last year to get these offensive reps. I don't necessarily think it's one or the other. I think it's what you're seeing is Mike McCarthy opening the playbook now because he has that trust and it's the time to do it. You're halfway through the season, start showing a little bit more of those unscouted looks to other teams and keep making your offense as unpredictable as you possibly can, especially going into the back end, back end of the season. So um, here's the thing. 
you have so many offensive weapons for Dak Prescott to utilize. You don't have to throw it all out at once yet. You really don't. And and you can kind of keep it that way until playoffs if you wanted to, because what you're doing right now is working. Just make sure guys stay healthy. And then you're talking about CeeDee Lamb. Yes, it's amazing to see him have all of these fantastic games and, and all of that, but I want to see a fresh CD lamb like that by the end of the season. So if that means Jalen Tolbert's getting a little more reps here, Michael Gallup takes a little bit more here, then do it. I, I still think the ball distribution is a little weird with the receivers right now though. Cause why was Brandon cooks not more involved last night? I, I know that's such a dumb gripe to have, but you have a Brandon cooks Yeah, utilize I him. I, I mean, it's, it's kind of nuts, but in terms of the run game, Dalton, I want to ask you, obviously not as productive as the past game by any stretch of the matter, but that's, that's kind of what this West coast offense is supposed to be. It's, it's the passing game, open up the run game uh, at some point, but ultimately where do you see We're halfway through the season. Now, where do you grade Tony Pollard and where he's at and how do you help this run game get a little bit more established now that you have your feet on the ground, really with the successful passing game that you know is there? Um, I just think that you use it complimentary. Uh, I think that the passing attack is first and foremost. I think you pass early, pass often. Use the run game on third and shorts, second and shorts, pick up first downs. It's just not, there's just not the same explosiveness that we had with the rushing attack. With Tony Pollard when he was not the, the lead back. And I think that you're still seeing bursts from Rico Dowdle. But I think... Overall, there just isn't as much pop with this rushing attack. And I don't really understand what the difference could be. I mean, schematically, it's a little bit different. I actually liked a lot of the things that Kellen Moore did in the run game. But I think overall, there's Tony Pollard just is uh, is pushing it a little bit. There are times on tape where I think that if he's a little bit more patient, there's going to be a hole that's opening up. It just feels like, hey, we're trying to get north and south as fast as humanly possible, and we're trying to pick up three yards in a cloud of dust. The problem is we're not the Philadelphia Eagles, and we can't get to third and one, fourth and one, and tush push our way, brotherly shove our way for a first down. And I think it's the best play in football. I know a lot of people want to ban. I think it's the purest. I think it's the purest form of it. football that there's left because I nobody's out there running the triple option anymore. But when I look at this thing as a whole, and I wanted to get back because we were talking about the offensive weapons, I'm switching it up, and I'm going to do my hot or not now. At Woo, here minutes. we go. So Let's get go. Ready. Let's go. Dalton Miller, what's your hot or not take for the week? Hit it. I don't care how good Luke Schoonmaker gets. That draft pick will always look bad because Jake Ferguson is the real deal. And I think... We kind of all saw last season that Jake Ferguson was the real deal. He is a much better athlete than his testing numbers were coming out of college for the NFL draft. That is a legitimate playmaker. That is a legitimate difference maker at tight end. And it doesn't matter how good Luke ends up being. I don't think he'll ever start over Fergie. And I think that Jake Ferguson will be a top 10 tight end in this league and I think that people are going to start looking at that after this year because people talked about Dalton Schultz being a top 10 guy Dalton Schultz he had a great game this week he had a big week I think he, he had like 130 yards he had a touchdown maybe two touchdowns but but as a talent Jake Ferguson is better period no I look put some respect on Fergie's name because I have been saying this if y'all know me and y'all know how much I just respect this tight end room. I've been riding high on this, put some respect on Fergie's name thing, because what you saw is about a year's worth of work from Dak and Jake. It, it, this this doesn't come one without the other. And it's very similar to what the conversation is around CD, right? These guys put in all of this off-season work at the DAC yard and at minicamp and OTAs and that trip to Atlanta. Guess who else was there? Jake Ferguson. And I think a lot of people forget that, that it wasn't just the receivers that were going on these trips. No, it was the tight end room as well. And Jake Ferguson, no, no doubt, was involved in that. He also went to tight end university over the summer, got to work there uh, for his second time again, uh, being invited to go do that. And so 
you're just seeing the product of all of the work that Jake has put in come to fruition and the trust that Dak Prescott has in that guy. Some of those balls that Dak is throwing, that's insane. That is insane. If you look at how tight some of those windows are that he's throwing these balls to Jake, I mean, trust. You, you want trust? You have it with uh, with uh, Jake Ferguson and Dak Prescott. So, yeah, no, I think put some respect on Jake Fergie's name, everybody, because he is here, he's staying, and he's a weapon. But overall, I mean, just absolutely impressed with what Ferguson was able to do last night. And like I said, guess what we're doing? We're opening up the playbook more to be able to see these things because they've always been there. We just haven't seen them in a game time uh, scenario yet. And so it's, it's kind of funny because when we're uh, sitting here talking about all of this and, and I know what I saw at mini camp and OTAs and training camp, I'm like, I swear guys, these plays exist. And then they happen. And I'm like, see, I was not crazy. Like you had to wait a little while, but I'm telling you what I saw and that's what I saw from Jake Ferguson all summer was he has worked his tail off to be that tight end one. He deserves it. And if this is only his second year jump, oh my goodness, imagine a Jake Fergie in a couple of years. Woo, exciting, exciting. I love tight, the tight ends are my favorite, my favorite position group by far. So for me to ha- see them have any success is really exciting. But let us know if you agree with Dalton's hot or not take of the week, everybody. We are uh, officially off of our Jake Ferguson rant and all of that. Defense, let's switch uh, keys real quick. What did you see from the defense? What did you not see? What were your biggest takeaways from this defense? Uh, in terms of the run D, let's start there. How was the run defense in this game? Do you think that they voted well, especially without Leighton Van Der Esch in this game? Yeah, I, I didn't think that the run defense was was too bad in this football game. Um, for me... The, the one thing defensively that I kind of want to address is something that I saw on social media. And I mean, it's just something that you always are going to see. There's always going to be a weak link or, or two. And there was a lot of, you know, J. Lou sucks um, stuff going around yesterday on, on you know, the uh, on Beyonce's Internet, as they would say. And I, I just want to address Beyonce's that. Beyonce's Internet? What? Yeah. You've never heard that before? No. Yeah, for some reason, it's Beyonce's internet. Anyways, <laughs> I love that. You're the pop culture person. I figured that you would know that. Um, I've never heard that. But uh, I-, I wanted to address that because the other side gets paid too. And I just want to point out that Dallas Goddard is one of the best tight ends in the NFL. <laughs> He's a-, a bona fide stud. He's also like eight inches taller than Jordan Lewis. So it doesn't matter how tightly contested that ball is. If Jalen Hurts throws a perfect pass, it's over because he's going to elevate over J-Lu. It's just like the touchdown down the left side of the field. Listen, it, Deron Bland was in great position. He just couldn't quite find the ball. It was a perfect pass. He, there's nothing that you can do against a perfectly placed ball when you are looking at guys like Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown, and Dallas Goddard. Those are three Really, really good football players. And I understand if you look at the secondary and you say, J. Lou is the weak link. Because he is. He is. But that's because Deron Bland is a very good football player. And Stephon Gilmore was an all-pro. So when you look at it, yes, he is the weak link. Yes, he gave up a couple of plays. But I, I just need everyone to understand that the other side gets paid to play football too. And sometimes those guys are just really good at the game. And that's what we got last night. Also want to point out that Jordan Lewis is returning from a Liz Frank injury. And I think I said that right, but yep, it's he did. A, a horrible foot injury. And he battled to be able to come back and play this game. And I think people tend to forget that when you come back from a massive injury like that, especially on a foot on a foot, okay? Like, you kind of need that to be able to play football, right? Um, <laughs> if you're coming back from that kind of injury, it's going to take you time to actually get those game times reps in. I mean, you're talking about a guy that hasn't played football since last October. He's only, what, a, a month in at this point to his return? Give it some time. Like, And I know that, does, that seems like an excuse. It's not. It's the reality of coming back from that kind of injury that he fought to get back into. And so not only does your body have to kind of rework and create new muscle memory for this new 
injury that your body had to rebuild from, but also your mentals have to come back in it. I mean, he didn't play football for a long time to have to deal with this stuff mentally. And you're rebuilding up to a full workload Jordan Lewis, who barely got that a couple of weeks ago. So give him some time. It's only halfway through the season. It, look, I keep saying this about this entire team is if you have to be on this slow and steady race to this up upward trajectory, allow that to happen because what you're going to start to see from the really good teams that came right out of the gates and uh, uh, lost three games in a row after they beat the Dallas Cowboys uh, is, is they start to kind of slow down a little bit. So if people have already plateaued early in the season, great for them. The Dallas Cowboys continue to work their way up and players specifically just allow it to happen. Just like, man, I hate when I hate when people go out there and they're like, oh, so-and-so sucks. That's not a football opinion. That's yeah. just a stupid tweet. Like, and, and we me also, nuts. Yeah, and we also have to, to realize, like, let's flip this on, on its head a little bit. Watch Reed Blankenship try to cover C.D. Lamb. Like, it, sometimes guys are just Same better. Thing. And it's already incredible, incredibly difficult to play that position in the NFL. I mean, look at let's Stefan Gilmore, somebody who did literally everything right on a play against AJ Brown and was still called for a defensive pass interference. Just because the, 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 the refs wanted to, to throw the flag on that play. I but, also just didn't see where the PI was and I'm pretty yeah. neutral. Look, if I see it, I'll be like, oh, okay, it's there. It, yeah. And non-existent. Look, yes. And, and I mean, just look at, you know, C.D. Lamb dunking on Darius Slay's head. You know, it, it, it happened. Darius Slay is one of the better corners in the NFLs. Sometimes the guy across from you just gets you beat. He just beats you. And that happens. That's their job. Quite that's a their bit. job. Yeah. <laughs> they need to. That's, they that's, need that's, to. All I wanted, that's all I wanted to say is that it's both sides point. get paid. It's a fantastic point. And I think uh, it, it is. it needed to be said. So thank you for that. Let's switch our gears a little bit because we are running out of time. Um, Cowboys take on the Giants for their second and final time this season. They're back home at AT AT&T Stadium on Sunday. So uh, home field advantage. Dalton, you're making a face. I don't know. I don't know. um, Because we've been here before. We've been here before. Um, Oh, wait. Can I use the Taylor Swift line here? Mm -hmm. I think I've seen this film before and Mm -hmm. I didn't like the ending. Yes, you did not (laughs) um, because it was week three when I said – uh, that we don't need to talk about this game because it's going to be a blowout because the other team is so bad. But I'm going to go back to that well. You know what? Don't do this again. A Tommy, don't. they cannot, they cannot stroll Tommy DeVito back out there on that football field and expect him to start or expect him to play because Brian Dayball did not want to throw the football with Tommy DeVito. And if you guys watch that game, You can understand why this should be an absolute bloodbath. Like one of the ugliest games that we have ever seen because the Arizona Cardinals, they were a pretty bad football team and they are where we're seeing it now. They're a pretty bad football team. We've seen what Josh Dobbs can do. Shout out to him and what he did in Minnesota this week, but look at the New York football giants over the past two weeks. Not only are they the worst team in the NFL, they've been one of the worst teams I've ever seen. I'm pretty sure they have less than 100 yards of total offense in the past two weeks combined. It's just not NFL caliber football right now. And could we see a little bit of a sleepy game from the Dallas Cowboys after a really hard fought one against the Philadelphia Eagles? Maybe. But the Cowboys usually do a really good job against divisional opponents. The New York football giants have nobody on the offensive line. Everybody got hurt. I think whoever is playing quarterback for them this next week is going to be in for an incredibly, incredibly long game. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm checking the uh, Twitter machine now. Ian Rappaport tweeting that it does appear the Giants have lost quarterback yeah. Daniel Jones for the season with a torn ACL pending an MRI. We're recording this on Monday morning. So by the time you hear this, it might be a little bit different. It might be officially official, but that's what we do know so far. Yeah. I, um, so I knew when wishing I, the best for him, man. That yeah. that sucks. It, I, I hate that for him. I really it, do. It was such a weird injury too, because like usually when we see non-contact knee injuries, it's like somebody's trying to cut and Daniel Jones is somebody who likes to run the football anyways. That knee must have been 
hanging on by a thread because he tore his ACL on a drop back. He, he was not touched. Nobody was pressuring him. He wasn't trying to get out of the way. He was literally just on his drop back and his knee gave out. And when his, as soon as that happened, when that sort of non-contact injury happens and the guy gets back up quick and goes back down, it's over. And, and, and it's really tough because, you know, obviously Daniel Jones is going to be financially stable at this point. He just got his, you know, really big contract. And I think that he's going to be okay, you know, in the end. But this team is going to be bad enough to where they're looking at a quarterback and he's going to be coming off an ACL. He wasn't good when he was healthy this year and the environment around him wasn't very good. But when you have the opportunity to kind of move on like that, maybe he gets a new look. I I just think that when you look at that situation, I, I don't know where they kind of go from here with Daniel Jones on the flip side for this game. You, you can't trot Tommy DeVito out there. And Tyrod Taylor is on IR already, so they don't have any other backup plans. We might see a Josh Dobbs situation here where somebody is yeah. is coming yeah. in off of the street to play because yeah. I, I, I can't imagine throwing DeVito back out there. It's it's really hard to, to see kind of where the Giants are right now in this situation because, look. Matt Barkley, you, Matt Barkley you, might have You just didn't. Them. Oh, really? May he might oh. have. I, I gotta look at their practice squad. I thought yeah. thought I saw sure. something about that. You just didn't expect the Giants team to look like this this season. You really didn't. I mean, uh barring injuries, you can't obviously you can't predict that. You can't prevent it either. But um, yeah, I think the Cowboys are going on uh their eleven game home streak of a win. So that's the longest current running in the NFL going back to last season. They go into 12, great, but yeah, they should not lose this game. They shouldn't. They shouldn't lose this game. And what I think will be really good for the Cowboys this week is you're coming off the loss to the Eagles. You know you need to continue to get these divisional wins, especially now you cannot lose to the Giants this week or the Commanders at any point. You need to kind of win out the rest of your divisional games if you want a chance to kind of have that higher seeding when when that kind of stuff comes into play later on uh in a few weeks which is crazy we're already halfway through the season i mentioned that 20 times because i cannot believe that it, this has gone by so fast um but no i think it'll be good for the cowboys to come out bully the heck out of them get your feet on the ground reestablish your identity and more importantly dalton for me what i want to see in this game let's establish the run Let's not abandon it. Let's try to establish it and be patient with it because I think what you see from this Cowboys team, and you kind of saw it in the third quarter uh, against the Eagles, is you you start to see them trying to establish something with the run, and then they stop, and they're like, no, 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 it's okay. Just go back to what's working. You have to be patient with this run game, and I really think the the answer here lies in the one-two punch that was successful. Why was Tony Pollard so successful uh, before he took the starting role? Well, because he wasn't getting all of the reps. And then you even go back to the conversations that followed Zeke. Everyone wanted to talk about how he wasn't fresh anymore and how he wasn't working and blah, blah, blah. When you're a, when you're a running back one and you're taking most of the reps, yeah, by this point in the season, you're going to slow down a little bit. And that's what it is. But you also have a guy in Tony Pollard that's adjusting to being that running back one. And he's not getting the one-two punch that Zeke had for the previous two seasons with him. He's not getting any kind of one-two punch. Rico Dowdle absolutely needs to be more involved in this run game if you want it to open up. You need to rely on how fresh he is right now. He's fresh. He's chomping at the bit to get on the field. He's physical. He's quick. I mean, why are you not relying on that more? So for me, if you want to start to get this run game established and kind of get your feet on the ground with that, this now is the game to do it. Wasn't against the Eagles, kind of figured that you wouldn't see a lot of it, so that's fine. But now, oh, just establish it, keep your receivers fresh, and just continue to do what you need to do to preserve people for the rest of the season. I don't disagree with that. I I think that it's it's a game where they should be up by multiple scores, and they'll have the freedom to work through things throughout this game. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Everybody, everyone should get reps at this point. I mean, don't show your hand too much because you don't need to. But again, if if it's a game where you have Dak Prescott sitting by the fourth quarter again and Cooper rushes in because they have a blowout win ahead of them, love that. 
love that. Mm-hmm. That should be the goal uh, for this game. So, Dalton, anything else you want to throw in there before we uh, officially end this week's episode about the Eagles game, the Giants game, anything Cowboys related or or otherwise? Anything you want to air out there? No, I don't think so. I, I think we're I think we're good to go. I've I've aired my grievances for the week. You feel good. You you mm-hmm. feel like you got it off your chest a little bit. I do I feel good? Oh, <laughs> good. I'm I, I'm so glad. Where can the people tweet you and find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dalton B Miller. Um, and if you guys are doing mock drafts at with the mock draft simulator at PFN for the Dallas Cowboys, if Talisi Fuaga is available from Oregon State, the right tackle, draft him with the Cowboys draft pick because he's a very good football player and I would love for him to be the Cowboys right tackle of the future. You know, I thought you said you were done venting, but uh, apparently not. You you just go ahead. You free flow. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. We'll go through this together uh, as we continue on. You can follow me at Jess underscore on Twitter, and I'm going to be at the Star all week uh, making sure – or filling filling things out in the locker room, seeing where everybody's at, talking to coaches and coordinators this week as well to see where they take the rest of their season going forward, how they feel post Eagles, what worked, what didn't, kind of all of that. So make sure to stay tuned. Plenty of good stuff coming in and keeping an eye on any injuries that might pop up uh, if they do throughout the week. So I'll be all over that as well. Dalton. Always an honor doing this podcast with you each and every week, bright and early on my Monday morning, but your Monday afternoon. Uh, So thank you for spending your Monday afternoon with me, my friend. Until then, everybody, please have a great rest of your week. Be safe watching the game wherever you decide to watch it over the weekend, and we will have plenty to talk about next week. See you then. 